the opportunity to uh, speak this afternoon. And um, if I could have my slides, please, and the slide changer. Thank you. I've slightly abbreviated my title. Um, I've, um, I'm going to talk about food security. And the messages that I would like to get to you this afternoon are basically that this is a complex challenge. Uh, I'm going to be talking about crops uh, because all food production is dependent on crops. I'm going to talk about how part of the solution is through enhancing productivity in agricultural systems. And I'm going to talk in particular about the role of genetics in doing that. And in making these points, what I would like to do is to touch on the themes of this conference, um, which are the anthrop Anthropocene, um, uh, the involvement of artificial intelligence, and also um, using uh, indigenous knowledge in order to benefit uh, food production systems. So, food security is a complex problem, and it relates to the Anthropocene topic of this conference because uh, food production agriculture contributes significantly to our global production of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, precisely how much depends on the region in which um, you're thinking about and also on the carbon footprint of the people that live in those regions. Uh, but globally, we're talking about a 20% contribution to greenhouse gas emissions from um, agriculture. So agriculture is contributing to uh, the problems of the Anthropocene. Uh, agriculture is also affected by the problems of the Anthropocene, and in particular, uh, climate change. So John Beddington, the former government chief science advisor in the UK, referred a few years ago to what he called a perfect storm uh, to do with uh, food security and food, su food supplies. And the convergence of the factors in the perfect storm involves population growth, involves climate change, and it involves uh, resource depletion in ecosystem services, in particular uh, water. <coughs> uh, so on the bottom left-hand side of my graphs there, you've got an illustration of the challenge associated with population increase that will, global population increase that will continue for some time to come, particularly acute in certain regions of the planet. And then on the right-hand side, there's a graph from uh, Pater Dasgupta's recent report uh, just showing you how we are eroding natural capital on the planet in part due to the involvement of um, agriculture. Now, how do we meet the challenge? And I know if you listen to various commentators, some people will say, well, the challenges of food security is often a failure of democracy. Uh, and that is undoubtedly true from time to time. And I dare say in the Sudan at the moment, the failure of food security there is a failure of uh, democracy. Um, people will also say um, that waste is a problem in the food system. And that's undoubtedly true. Uh, so at the moment, uh, globally, around 14% of all food produced is lost from the post-harvest stage and another 10% or so is lost at the retail stage. So yes, um, food waste is a problem. But I think it's undi undeniably true um, that these challenges cannot always be addressed in full. And so what we need to do is to address productivity. We need to increase the productivity of um, agricultural systems. And this graph just illustrates and in the green regions um, where uh, productivity is going to be insufficient um, for the different crops. So then we need to meet the challenge of food security by improving productivity in agricultural systems. Now, 
in the past, and in particular in the recent past, uh, the productivity or the improved productivity of agricultural systems has been shadowed by an increase in the area of crops grown. Uh, so there hasn't been an increase in the productivity per area, there's just been an increase in the area of crops grown. This is a problem because there is no more land to use for agriculture. And if we are to increase productivity, what we need to be able to do um, is to uh, increase uh, the amount of food produced per area of agricultural land. Now, precisely how you do this depends on the region that you're talking about. So in industrial agriculture, you've got a whole raft of different approaches that you can be using. Um, so machinery, you've got robotics, you've got remote sensing, chemistry, new approaches including vertical farming. And these are all approaches that can benefit hugely um, from uh, computing, I dare say, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence um, at different stages. But these approaches are not always appropriate, particularly in low input agricultural systems where um, scale and resource availability are not appropriate for um, these uh, very high tech approaches. And the point I would like to make to you uh, this afternoon is that one approach though where technology can help in high and low input systems is through the use of genetics. And the reason why genetics is such a versatile uh, approach to enhancing food production is because you essentially deliver the technology in the seed. So when you provide the seed to the farmer, he or she can then uh, propagate that new technology from one generation to the next. So it's a versatile system that is appropriate to both or versatile innovation that's vers appropriate to both high input and low input systems. So what do I mean by genetics? Well, genetics is essentially two approaches. So one is um, genetic analysis and the other is genome enhancement. So in uh, recent years, um, uh, genetic analysis increasingly involves um, genome analysis and all of the things that we heard about this morning from um, Eric Lander about the application of genomics to human health solutions applies also to um, agriculture because we have um, uh, genome analysis in crops uh, at the same level and we can benefit from genome analysis uh, in the same way. We've got a number of different approaches to uh, genome enhancement and I'll talk about those as I go through my talk. But this is uh, making the point here about genomics is my cross-reference to artificial intelligence uh, and that theme of the conference that we've got. And I'd refer you to a very good report from the National Academy of Sciences uh, that refers to advances in food and agriculture published in 2018, but it's still very relevant. And it describes how genome analysis is allowing us to identify um, genetic factors um, that account for the major limiting constraints in crop productivity. So uh, genetic analysis, genome analysis can be coupled, of course, to uh, plant breeding. I just wanted to mention one innovation. It's actually a very simple innovation um, that is being used widely now in um, uh, crop breeding, and it's called speed breeding. But it basically, so in plant breeding, you need to take your plants through several generations. Traditionally, we've been able to get two or three generations of a crop per year. But now, uh, through the simple expediency, and I don't understand why we didn't do this a long time ago, of just growing the plants under high and continuous light, we can actually get five or six generations of the plants through each year. So this means coupling uh, genome analysis to this very simple expediency. Uh, we can get uh, a lot more out of classical plant breeding than we've been able to in the past. 
genome editing, CRISPR-Cas that we all have heard about, is also a very powerful innovation in uh, uh, crop plant enhancement. Uh, so this too is coupled to our understanding of genomes and the genetic factors um, that uh, influence crop productivity. And there are some wonderful innovations that I don't have time to go to this, uh, in, into this afternoon, where when uh, gene editing was first developed in plants, we needed to couple it to a GM approach. We would need to transform the plants. But now um, we're able to use gene editing without doing that, using virus vectors, for example, to deliver the components of the gene editing system. So we can um, do um, all of these various gene editing um, innovations. And there are a number of examples uh, of important traits that are being introduced into crops um, using uh, gene editing. An additional approach is what I prefer to call gene addition. It used to be called um, uh, GM, or genetic modification, uh, but this is a somewhat tainted term, and I think a more realistic uh, and useful term is gene addition. So using the technology based on agrobacterium and other methods, we can add new genes into crops, and this is being used to enhance the productivity of crops in a number of different ways. And I just want to give you one example here um, this is a, product, a project from the Danforth Institute in St. Louis, uh, where they're developing virus-resistant cassava for Africa and addressing a huge constraint over uh, cassava production uh, in um, Africa at, at present. So these are the various um, innovations benefiting from new technology and new approaches, including um, AI. Uh, so how are we going to make this happen? Well, um, one way that we can make this happen is through training and partnerships. And I've just given uh, a couple of examples here where maybe regions of, let's say, intensive agriculture can pass knowledge to um, uh, regions of low input agricultural systems. But I want to make one point, which is that this uh, communication between different agricultural communities needs to go in two directions uh, because uh, there is a lot to be learned from uh, traditional agricultural practice uh, that can benefit uh, industrial agriculture throughout the planet. And I just want to tell you about one example here, um, which is called push-pull. And this is a system used in maize cultivation, and it's basically companion cropping. And it involves growing maize together with a forage grass and a legume. And um, the forage grass attracts the stem borer moth away from the um, maize. Um, the uh, desmodium repels the stem borer moth away from the maize. So hence the fact it's called push-pull. It involves a cover crop, the uh, legume, uh, uh, that also fixes nitrogen. So this is a wonderful system, a companion cropping system uh, that can uh, benefit um, industrial agriculture as well as um, uh, low input agricultural systems. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about regenerative agriculture and regenerative agriculture is, I believe, um, uh, agriculture in intensive agricultural systems, but taking advantage of practice that we've uh, historically associated with um, low input and traditional agricultural systems. So this is an example of how um, we can uh, uh, get two-way communication that can benefit all types of agriculture. So this is where I'll finish. Um, uh, my um, uh, conclusions are um, that uh, food security is dependent on enhanced production systems. Um, we can use various technologies to achieve this, uh, but partnerships and two-way exchange between people doing different types of agriculture is going to be very productive in the future. So thank you, and I'll stop there.